Welcome back. We're, we're almost there, you all. Let's stick with us, stick with us. We're almost there. Um, we have a lot uh, uh, more to go. Um, so I promised um, both Olga and Musa that we would um, give them the floor now um, and allow them to, to make their interventions they wanted to do earlier. And then I'm going to turn the floor over to Hadar, who's going to shift us from fear to hope. <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> Um, because we, we have already heard some very good stories, but we want to hear more encouraging uh, stories about what, where we can go from here. So I'm going to ask Olga if you can tell us um, a little bit about what's going on. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Karen, dear president. Um, well, it's very funny because 37 years ago, I wanted to talk to you exactly about what's going on <laughs> because you called my country uh, the greatest threat to the mankind. Well, most unfortunately, the uh, situation is still there. I mean, it was a little bit better in the 90s, but now we are in the same place. So now, 37 years later, I have to ask you to be our messenger. I represent here my own organization, Freedom Files. I still work in Moscow. I'm still inside that scary place. Um, and also, I represent Civic Solidarity Platform. It's a a horizontal structure that was set around Helsinki principles and is active on the Helsinki Eckert territory, which means that it's former Soviet Union. And exactly what I'm going to talk about is uh, why everybody should care what's happening on our one-sixth part of the world um, about this huge elephant or a predating T-Rex in the room. Uh, well, I know it's, a, it's hard after lunch, but Let's hope, and um, I want to have your allies on that. So why it's still scary? Um, most unfortunately, as we heard yesterday, uh, Russia is setting a role model for autocracies. It's um, the worst corrupt, unaccountable, and deceitful government. It not only kills its own citizens, uses internal repression, but it also now employs external aggression, both military, on the countries like Ukraine or Georgia to interfere with their democratic transition. And also, uh, it has waged an informational warfare over the world. And most unfortunately, people do believe that propaganda. So it's very, very dangerous. Uh, there is also outright buying of politicians, academia, um, and other media representatives. Um, worse, Russia is sitting on the, national, uh, on the UN Security Council. And then there is an answer, why cannot we, you know, do something about Assad? Russia is helping to gas Syrian people. Why cannot we enact more forces in Africa? Because Russia is blocking it, it has a veto right. So it's very dangerous. That's why we want Russia to be democratic and accountable. Uh, the other bad news is that Russia is not alone. USSR has not died, it has transformed into union of petty dictatorships. They do inside hate each other. Uh, dictator of Azerbaijan Aliyev, dictator of Belarus Lukashenko, uh, Kazakhstani leader Nazarbayev. But when it comes to international arena, they help each other because it's democracy and human rights that they fear the most. This is why Russia is helping Azerbaijan to corrupt and buy politicians and academia over two sides of the ocean. We just finished investigation and campaigning to make Council of Europe, uh, uh, the Parliament Assembly of Council of Europe accountable about that. Uh, that's why Lukashenko is skillfully playing uh, West against each other. Uh, that's why Kazakhstan and Russia and others are abusing Interpol and using them, uh, that structure for prosecution of human rights defenders. And that happens all over the world. Uh, what Civic Solidarity Platform does about that, where the solidarity comes in. Uh, we do in, employ things like fact-finding missions, solidarity observation missions. Uh, we deliver those directly from the ground to international structures, what is really happening there. We are doing investigative things. I personally do that, um, uncovering the corruption. We are trying to talk to the media, but we need more understanding and more amplifying of our message. Uh, because if we understand that we are in the same boat, it will be easier. So what I'm asking for, President, what kind of message I want you to deliver um, to politicians, um, 
media, sales, academia, etc. First and foremost, uh, we've been told quite frequently in the corridors that you know it's now the time of pragmatic approach. As you and uh, Senator Sanders discussed yesterday, uh, human rights are pragmatic because human rights mean security. There is no security, no peace without human rights. So that's the primary issue. But the secondary, but also very important issue that what happens inside our countries do matter because otherwise you have spillover that I have described. You have corroding of your own governments. You have corroded international security system. You have propaganda. You cannot just you know, say, I don't care about enforced disappearances in Turkmenistan and I want to use their gas, because it will have spillover effect. You cannot say, I want oil or gas from Azerbaijan and I don't care about political prisoners, because then you have corruption. And also you have people, you know, going to ISIS. There are many people joining ISIS from North Caucasus, South Caucasus and Central Asia because they have no other place to go. So that's the message. Now, what the world should do about that? First and foremost, we think that existing sanctions are not enough. We think that it's been very mild, so we want comprehensive, targeted, and the individual and sectoral sanctions against perpetrators. It's not only Russia, we think that uh, quite a few governments should be held accountable. For example, I think it's just outrageous that Belarusian sanctions were suspended just three weeks ago, while people are still being beaten and put in jail for them protesting against social injustice and political prosecution. I think it's just outrageous. I think it's outrageous that Rex Tillerson wants Russian sanctions regarding oil industry suspended. We know all his background. We know what oil industry has done in many places, from Agoniland to Russia. Uh, what else? We know that it's not only formal, not only sanctions that you can introduce, but you can also influence by political statements, banks and other businesses, making them choose between dictatorship and democracy. I remember that Cheney, when he wanted uh, German and other European banks to stop doing business with Iran, he said, you have to choose. You have to choose between United States and Iran. And banks made the right choice. So there is this influence beside judicial sanctions. We want more investigations in dirty money. We want to stop those dictators who rob their people to use their money both for their own pleasure and also for corrupting uh, the democratic project. And we think that West is falling far behind what should and could be done. So we want more investigations, we want more legal actions on that. Also, we want more universal jurisdiction to be used. I mean, the whole UN system allows that. You have treaties that foresee uh, judicial responsibility for war crimes, but not, not only war crimes, but also for torture, for enforced disappearances. It's the right of the country who joined those conventions to use it as a tool, as a grounds for prosecution of the perpetrators. How many people have been brought to justice on that? except maybe Serbians, and, and I'm not sure, on one of the African states, have you, oh yeah, Pino, Pinochet, yeah, that's, that happened too. I haven't heard much of anything more. So I think universal jurisdiction is important, and it's also a great solidarity tool. And I think, I'm, I'm, look, I'm a journalist by training and a communication specialist. I think that it would be good to advise media leaders, general media leaders, uh, to rethink the way they cover news. I know that the media is supposedly free, free in democratic countries. Well, depending on business, of course, but you know, they should understand that this is the issue of security. So there should not be just, you know, that someone was beaten, someone was killed, but more systemic reporting on systemic issues. I know it's not that catchy, but you know, we have to start somewhere. And also, of course, we need to invest more in uh, independent media like uh, Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, and others. And of course, protection and strengthening of uh, international institutions and support for civil society, including, uh, including um, global access to internet, like projects on global Wi-Fi done by Elon Musk or by Google. We would really like to have that. So I'm ending here, 
and I would really like to see in five years from now, <laughs> not dictatorships united, but democracies united for a good course. Thank you. And Musa, Mahmoud Modi. Um, thank you very much, Karen, and good afternoon, everyone. President Carter and all distinguished guests and participants. Uh, I'm so pleased and privileged to be here at this very important forums with fellow human rights defenders from across the world. Uh, we talked a lot about fear and, you know, hope and success and, you know, uh, probably some lessons learned. One of the issues that we, I would like to br bring here is the success that we have made in Afghanistan. As you may remember or not, Afghanistan was invaded by the Soviet Union in 1979 and, uh, you know, the problem, the conflict and all misery started by then and, you know, ended by the Taliban uh, regime ruling Afghanistan, denying every Afghan citizens their rights, especially women, because they did not want to, uh, the women to go to school, go to work, or even go alone shopping uh, at the streets. So uh, when the Taliban collapsed in 2001, a new era in Afghanistan started, and since then we have made tremendous achievements on promotion and protection of human rights, and Afghanistan has transformed. Unfortunately, that achievements and progress is a very fragile one. Uh, the, the, the situation is such that it could be reversible you know, every moment, every day, and that's threatened by ISIS, by Taliban, and by hardliners who are preaching hatreds and, you know, violence and resorting to violence in Afghanistan. Uh, how we succeeded, you know, in achieving human rights in Afghanistan uh, at the current stage or situation, because we believed in shared responsibility. The international community and Afghans came together to work together for promotion of um, protection of human rights. And that shared responsibility is, is still a valid uh, you know, idea in Afghanistan con uh, context as well as everywhere else. So we have to you know, look at the, when we talk about promotion and protection of human rights as a shared responsibility everywhere. So I have to, I would like to emphasize on that shared responsibility. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the progress we have made are the, you know, progress on the freedom of media, freedom of assembly, freedom of association, and, uh, you know, transforming Afghanistan from a country ruled by Taliban to a semi-democratic system that, uh, you know, for the first time we had a presidential election, parliamentary elections, and then transferred power from an elected president, president to another one. So that was a major success to Afghanistan context, and uh, we have to, uh, we should acknowledge that one. But there were also, you know, some mistakes that were made, like in Lisbon conference in 2010 in November, when uh, you know NATO allies in the summit announced that the, in 2014 they are going to leave Afghanistan and withdraw their troops and their presence in Afghanistan, that was an opportunity for everyone to think otherwise, you know, leave, you know, the momentum of success, the momentum of achievements, and, you know, become fearful and back to the, you know, the era of fear. And I remember many international colleagues, scholars, academia, journalists coming to us and saying that, okay, in 2014, the international communities are going to leave Afghanistan. What are you going to do? And we started telling them, you know, that we did not start working for uh, promotion, protection of human rights in Afghanistan because of the international community. Of course, we are, you know, obliged and grateful to their support financially and morally and politically, but it was a work for Afghanistan people and Afghanistan citizens, and because we, we believe that Afghans, like other people in the world, you know, deserve to be protected and, uh, you know, deserve dignity, freedom, and human rights. So that, uh, that beliefs keep us moving until now, which is 2017, and we're still there. Uh, we are there in the face of challenges, risks, and threats from ISIS, Taliban, and everyone. 
now we have, you know, a, a, a two, three issues that I would like to, you know, highlight here, and that might be an interest to the Carter Center and other colleagues, especially the UN, as well, to 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 pay attention to that. The first, uh, Mr. President, you have been a champion of election, and we have. Uh, we had the election in 2014, and unfortunately, because of the, you know, allegation of rigging elections and you know fraudulent uh, and uh, irregularities, the election was stopped, and the process has never, you know, started again. And we we have a parliament that is, you know, illegitimate, you know, overdue to for by two years, uh, without any election, and the provincial council's election was was due in May, and we still don't have a date for election, and it is not. You know, uh, at the same uh, at the moment, visible that when we are going to have another election, because without election, the entire institution, the democratic institution in Afghanistan, would be in question, and many people uh, sacrificed their lives in 2014, lost their hands because they went to the uh, ballot boxes and uh, casted their vote for you know their uh, choosing leader. But unfortunately, since then, we don't have the a, a, a credible and viable process to start, you know, an election. So, any attention on and helping Afghanistan to go back to the election cycle, it would help greatly peace, security, stability, as well as human rights and freedom in the country. The second issue is that, of course, after the withdrawal of the international troops and community from Afghanistan in 2014, the space for human rights defenders, civil society organizations, NGOs, charity and humanitarian services shrank in Afghanistan greatly because there were a system that in every province there was a provincial reconstruction team led by the international troops. And when they withdraw from them, it, they put at risk all those who have worked and you know or were active in that region so it's a great uh, you know need for uh, in order to uh, um, keep the achievements and uh, uh, maintain the progress and success we have made in afghanistan to help the human rights defenders civil society organizations and women rights and human rights activists in the country which they are in every day under threats and under intimidation of, from isis taliban and everyone um, well of course we would not diminish uh, democracy to election uh, last year there was a, a big protest in kabul uh, because many people wanted you know uh, public service they wanted electricity to come to their homes and uh, they went to the street in Kabul, and unfortunately, uh, there were a suicide bombing, and uh, 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 over 80 people were killed, and over five, 400 people were injured. Since then, uh, there is uh, an inclination that no one should go to street, no one should go to demonstrate, and there is a willingness from the government of Afghanistan to limit uh, or to amend the law of on protest uh, that uh, to not allow people to go out. So that's a, a threat to the democracy and uh, rights to uh, assembly in Afghanistan, which is important to consider. The other threats that I'm, I'm going to conclude that uh, in peace and uh, you know justice in Afghanistan, we are struggled a lot to. Uh, bring justice and uh, you know human rights in Afghanistan. Now, under the pressure of the international communities, uh, the government of Afghanistan has to enter to the pro political process, and they already entered to one political process with one of the very notorious warlords in the country, Gulbuddin Hikmatyar, and brought him and welcomed, you know, a hero, give them a hero welcome in, you know, last week. Uh, he came back to Kabul without acknowledging the loss of lives in the country, without, uh, you know, uh, apologizing to the victims of families that he was the perpetrators of taking their beloved lives and, you know, uh, but he came in without, uh, with immunity, with, uh, with impunity. That kind of situation, uh, no, it, it uh, in a sense, uh, jeopardized the achievements and the sacrifices of all those men and women and international communities that they came in and said that human rights justice uh, uh, would be, you know, uh, something that we are working together as a shared responsibility. And now the same thing would be with the Taliban. And I urge the international community, like uh, especially the United States, that 
today, uh, some of the countries hyped ISIS in Afghanistan in order to legitimize uh, Taliban. Uh, Russia, Iran, Pakistan are working to, um, you know, with Taliban to legitimize that. This is a danger. We should know that Taliban is the cause and the reason that ISIS is there, the Al-Qaeda is there, and everyone is there, and they are a menace to human rights and freedom and dignity in Afghanistan. Uh, I know that Karen is asking me to stop here, and I hope that uh, coming together here and uh, you know listening from each other, uh, we uh, we don't you know uh, uh, leave each other alone and you know, stay in solidarity and work together to achieve, and also you know maintain and continue our progress uh, in hard countries and conflict affected countries like Afghanistan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, now I'm going to ask Hadar to shift the tone just slightly <laughs> um, to, from fear to hope. We want very much to feature um, the idea that we can transform. Um, as Jin said, fear uh, empowerment is fear transformed, and that's what we want to shift to. So Hadar, take it away. OK. So I, I just want to make it clear again that I get to be the, the tough one in all of this moderating. My name is Hadar Harris. I'm an international human rights attorney, having lived and worked in about 25 countries. And I'm now focused on that experience to protect and support human rights defenders and civil society here in the United States. I haven't checked with everybody, but I'm going to go out on a limb, as I often do, which you know for the two minutes that we've sat together, um, and speak on behalf of all the human rights defenders here. And thank you, President Carter and Mrs. Carter, for bringing us together. Some of us are under direct threat. Others are leaving recent trauma. And most of us are going back to very uncertain and very dangerous realities. Having this opportunity to come together, to build solidarity, and to reflect on our common challenges is critically important. So spending this last substantive session focused on hope and solidarity is even more important. There have been many moments of hope throughout our discussions, despite the fact that you, know, you, can, you can look at it glass full or glass empty. I had two grandmothers, one who was glass full, one who was glass empty. It was sort of interesting. But there have been many moments of hope throughout our discussions. Kranti said, we've been sharing a lot of light. Andrew discussed the goosebump moments. Anna showed us that change is possible. Hope from the Russian dissident movements, which led to big change. Mariam said, people don't need saving, they need solidarity. Khalid said, people know what they need, they don't know how to get it. And Jin said, empowerment is fear transformed. So here we are empowering each other, transforming each other and talking about hope. I've asked a few people to speak for a few moments about hope. Now, I know that there's a tension between inclusivity and dictatorship. <laughs> and I don't want to be critiqued in this room, but with the permission of President Carter, which I checked beforehand, I am going to keep a timer. And I'm going to let the timer ring at the end of five minutes. So except for with Lisa, who who, you know, again, in, you know, got the fix in with Karen. I had it. She has a little bit longer. So we want to be sure that in the time remaining, we really have adequate time to be able to focus on hope, to be able to think about those threads that we've brought together and woven together over these last four days um, and ensure that we have time to focus on the positive and the possible. So with that, I'm going to turn it over at the beginning to Lisa. I'm going to set my timer. OK. Um, and, and we look forward to your comments. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Lisa Sharon Harper. I'm the Chief Church Engagement Officer at Sojourners in Washington, DC, and also now founder of Freedom Road, um, an organization that's Oh, sorry, thank you. An organization that's, that's really all about helping to shrink the narrative gap between, uh, between the colonized and the colonizers, um, or, or post-colonizers. I want to offer three words that give me hope as a person of faith, as a person from the Abrahamic tradition, in particular, the Christian tradition among those, and in, I, even out of the Christian tradition, the evangelical Christian tradition. 
I took a pilgrimage about 13 years ago through the American South. We traveled over 10 states in the course of four weeks. We retraced the Cherokee Trail of Tears and then the African experience in America from slavery through civil rights. And when I got to the end of that journey, I was struck that my own understanding of the good news of my faith was mute in the face of the greatest injustices that happened on our land. It had nothing to say. So that's what actually propelled me into 13 years of swimming in the book of Genesis. I kid you not, every single sermon I preached for 13 years started in Genesis, particularly Genesis 1. So I want to share with you, after 13 years of swimming there, what I found, because I found some good stuff, OK? Um, the first one is, the, I want to share three words. The first word is actually a phrase. It's tov me'od. So tov me'od is the word very good. Very good is, for the Hebrews of the time, it would have been like, as we think of today in the, in the English language, perfection. But we get our, our concept, in, especially in the Western world, of perfection from the Greeks. They thought of perfection as existing inside the thing. But the, the Hebrew faith was not a, Hebrew, a Greek faith, it was Hebrew. The Hebrews understood goodness, tov, to exist between things, not in the thing itself. And that word me'od actually means radical overflowing, overwhelming, so that when at the end of, of Genesis 1, God looks around and says, this is very good, what God was actually saying was that the relationships, the relatedness between all creation was overwhelmingly good. The relatedness between humanity and God was forcefully good. The relationship between men and women was forcefully good. The relationship between us and the rest of creation was forcefully good. And the relationship between all creation and the systems that govern us, the way things work, was forcefully good. Now go back, let, go back a little earlier in the same day and you get the word salem. That's the word image or uh, representative figure. It's the word that the Greeks used, uh, and actually you even see it in the, in the New Testament, um, where uh, it means representative figure. It's what the king used to place his representative figure at the entrance of a gate to let people know this is where the king rules. Well, here the text tells us that all humanity is made in the image of God, the salem of God. We are all representative figures of God. In the UDHR, it tells us that we are endowed with inherent dignity. Well, where does that dignity come from? In the Christian faith, it actually, we believe it comes from this place right here, the fact that we are all made in the image of God. But there's something even more radical that's spoken in this, in this word that gives me hope. And the word, and also helps me to see what's, what's really jacked up about our world. It's the word rada, dominion. In the same breath that God says, let all humanity be made in the image of God, God also says, and let them have dominion. Well, that word, that, that pairing of being made in the image of God and exercising dominion, those two things are now linked. They're inextricably put together in the text. In other words, what it means to be human is to be made in the image of God. And what it means to be made in the image of God, to have inherent dignity, is to be created with the call of God and the capacity, all things being equal, to exercise stewardship of the world. Now, there's some implications here. One, that very goodness is about the overwhelming wellness of all the relationships in creation. Two, that if very goodness is about the overwhelming wellness of relationships, then what it means to break relationship is actually what we in the, in the Christian tradition call sin. Sin is no longer about us being imperfect. It's no longer about purity or having the fundamental right belief, but rather it is about what we do to break relationship with any of the relationships God called very good in the very beginning. Three, all humanity is made in the image of God. Four, if you are made in the image of God, you are created to exercise stewardship of the world. And finally, 
when we govern in a way that diminishes the capacity of any people or people group to exercise stewardship of the world, and the fastest and easiest is through poverty and oppression, then we are also diminishing the image of God on earth. Now, we have to face the reality that in our constructs of how we have chosen to live together, we have chosen political constructs, political as in the most pure form of the word, how the polis shall live together, in our conversations of how the polis will live together. We've chosen to make definitive choices based on constructs of race or gender or religion or nationality or sexuality. All of these things are constructs that lead to logics of domination. For example, with race in particular, I had a really interesting conversation in the hallway um, yesterday. Um, race is an absolute construct. Not, it has nothing to do with the color of our skin. Plato in 360 BC was the first Western philosopher that I could find that actually began to define race. You know what he said it was? He said that race is the different metals that we're made of. People are made of gold and silver and copper and that race then determines what, how you will serve society. But then Linnaeus or Pontifex, sorry, the Pontifex Romanus was written, the Doctrine of Discovery that began to divide race and make a hierarchy out of it and called savage and civilized. And that was the first hierarchy or bifurcation of humanity and the structure of how we live. And then you had Linnaeus who actually broke it down into color. And, um, and he actually said, uh, black Africanus is on the bottom while white Europeanus is on the top. Red Americanus is in the middle and yellow Asiatus is under them right in the middle as well. And then you had judicial rulings in the United States that created race-based slavery. And in the United States in particular, we had the Three-Fifths Compromise and the Immigration Act of 1790 and the first census that only had one race on the census and that was white. And then the Supreme Court cases where immigrants entered America throughout the entire 18th century, 1800s into the 1900s, arguing that they were white. Why? Not because they hated their ethnicity or their race, or sorry, their, their nationality, but because that's what gave them power. So this has been the struggle in the United States since the founding of our nation, and it's been the struggle that the colonized world has experienced. And in a globalized world, the Republic, Plato's Republic extends beyond borders. The logics of race are wide. They're not just about color. The logic of blackness and whiteness is that chattel must be controlled and confined and commodified. The logic of the savage and civilized is that the savage must be eradicated. The logic of Middle Eastern and Asian is that it's inferior. It's an inferior civilization, still okay, but not quite as good as Europeans. And it's a warrior threat that needs to be defeated. Race is not the only logic of domination, but the common thread in all of the logics is the belief that some people were created to rule while others were created to be ruled. There you go. That was perfect. Can I, can I wrap it up really quickly? You have okay. time. Okay. The implications for us, as much as the human rights regime exists to mitigate against the logic of domination in our world, the people that make up the human rights regime are part of the world. The human rights regime rose from the soil of Western hegemony. Thus, in order to not have to ask the same questions that we're asking here 60 years from now, we must ask the hard questions now. In what ways does the human rights regime unwittingly reinforce the reality of white power and Western hegemony in the global community? In what ways would we need to shift in the strategy and mechanisms of the UN to break Western hegemony? And do we even really want that? And if not, what does it reveal about what we really believe in answer to the question of who has been created to steward the world? Here's my fear. My fear is that we will, we will not actually face those questions and we will continue to have the logics of domination at work in our world. But solidarity, Solidarity can actually get us past that, past that, that barrier. There's a fourth word, the word demuth, which actually means the likeness of God, but the meaning of it is that we are not God. It's, it's a call to humility. 
And so the remedy is that for those to be raised up um, by the logics of domination to humble themselves. And for those that are pushed down by the logic of domination to rise up and maybe then we will be able to share humanity. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I'd like to call on Ella from Liberia, who's going to speak for five minutes, telling a story that she shared with us of hopeful intervention and solidarity. When you turn your light on, I'll start my timer. <laughs> it's not on. It's not on yet. The, the red light will come on. You yeah, push the button. That looks like it has a little person talking. speaking. There you go. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm happy that I'm in this conference. Because through these things, you can get to know your own value and know that some of the things that you have been doing and you didn't know the importance of it, you will get to know it from here. And I'm very much delighted that I could come again and see my president who happens to be the core father of peace and human rights all over the world. And I can tell you that Liberia has really felt your presence. We want to say a very big thank you to you. Uh, it was uh, during the year 2003 when we had a civil crisis in Liberia. And the war took everywhere and the low slum community where I live and where I am presently. The war took us from two fronts. We had the government soldiers and we had the rebels on the other side. And we were between the, the, the river and the sea and we just had one pathway out. And it happens that the government soldiers always came in our area and shot at the rebels and they too returned the shots. And at the end of the day, it was only civilian that was dying and no soldiers. And so it went on for days. And I got up one day and I went through the community asking people, are we going to sit here? And all of us died. What can we do, madam? We are harmless. We are armless. We don't know which way to turn. And I just got up one day all by myself. How I got that uh, motivation, what really inspired me, I don't know. But I just saw myself to the rebel end. And while I was approaching them, I still remember a voice came from the rebels. Madam, come down before shots go. Uh, some shot come from somewhere and hit you. And that's how I came down on the bridge and I started to crawl to them. And when I got there, they made a three human lines in front of me. What do you want? And I told them, I, I'm coming from that slum area where you are shooting every day. And I have come to let you know that you are shooting at the soldiers, but no soldier have died since you have been shooting there. It's only the armless civilians that are dying who don't know anything about arm. Yes, but madam, we can't do otherwise because it is your people that are shooting at us and we don't have any other way. But if you can go back and tell your people not to shoot at us, then we will stop the shooting. And I told them, no, I don't have the means of stopping them. But whatever we can do in our own way, we will try to do it. But to give you the assurance that we will stop them totally from shooting at you, that we can't. And we stood there like two, three minutes and nobody was talking and then I asked, can I go? And then somebody came from the bike, a soldier, and asked me, what religion you belong to? And I told the person I'm a Muslim. And he just turned around and went back. And then the next question was, do you wait for government? And I told them right there, there is no government now. So what government do, uh, uh, do I wait for? If there is no government, we are fighting war. And then we stood there like two, three minutes again, and I asked them, can I go? And they said, yes, go and be careful. Please don't stand up straight. And there was the rebel that was advising me. Please don't stand up straight so that um, shot cannot come from anywhere to hit you. Later did I know that the people of my community have come together in an area standing there waiting. I don't know how they saw me going. But by the time I got off the site, 
of the rebels and got down some part of my community. It was like 50 to 60,000 human beings there waiting. And they said, oh my, what did they say? What did they say? What did they say? And it's like I was speechless until I got home. I drank a glass of water and then I told them the story. Just there at that point, our government soldiers started to come in again with a little jeep they had with a gun mounted on it. And that's how people ran to the house. Oh, ma'am, they are coming again. And I just ran out there and stood in the middle of the street. And I told them, you cannot shoot here. What's wrong with you? I said, I'm crazy. <laughs> Move from the road. I said, no. And while I was talking now, behind me, it's like the whole community came and stood behind me. And then while we were there talking with the soldier that had come before with their gun mounted, their, their chief came. And at that point, he, he gave himself a name, 50-50. And when he came, he said, but what are these people doing on the road? And the soldier said, I don't know. We just saw this uh, woman, and she came and stood on the road, and all the other people came. So he got down and asked me, and I explained to him, and then I told him, I said, you have been sending your people here to kill us. And because they have not had the means to kill us, this is why they asked the rebel across there to kill us. And since people been down here that you know, have you lost one soldier? He said, no. I said, but then we are tired. He said, oh, but when these people come, they can only come here and go back and tell me that they came to look around to see if no rebel had crossed here. But in, I didn't know that they were shooting here. I said, well, they have killed a lot of people here. And truly, a lot of people died. And so that's how he said he was sorry. This was the man from the government side. He was sorry, and then he gave us a number that we should call anytime, whenever any of the soldiers go there and misbehave. And you see, at first we were, <laughs> at first we were uh, afraid. We had this fear. But at the end of the day, inspiration came from nowhere, and we had hope in ourselves. Why? Because the confidence at that point that was built now, that the people of that community saw that they had somebody that could speak for them, that could go out and advocate for them. So at the end of the day, even as I speak, we have authority in the area, but whatever confront any of the citizens, they will come to me first, and I okay. refer them to whoever. Thank so we want to say a very big thank you, thank and you. we want all of us to have the hope and forget about fear. Fear cannot take you anywhere, but at the end of the day, if you really exercise that power which God has given you, you will gain hope and solidarity will come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ella. Thank you. I should have known better because if you stared down the rebels and the government troops, you were not going to be scared from my signal here. <laughs> so lesson learned. Um, Nigat from Pakistan is going to share a few moments of digital solidarity with us. Uh, thank you so much. I had jot down my thoughts so you don't have to remind me. Uh, so um, I will anyway. <laughs> Uh, I'll try to ignore. <laughs> uh, I'm honored to be here and to um, share this big table with President Carter and Mrs. Carter and my wonderful, courageous friends all over the world. Um, I'm very humbled and never imagined I would be sitting with you all here. And I must confess that I have been tweeting and posting pictures of President Carter and Senator Sanders uh, online about my fangirl moment since yesterday. <laughs> um, President Carter, I'm from Pakistan, uh, but I'm part of a global digital rights movement. The internet cyberspace has no borders. Thus, I call myself a citizen of the world. When I started working for internet freedom in Pakistan, I was criticized for advocating for rights to privacy and freedom of speech online. I was told that this country has no basic human rights. So why you have chosen digital rights at Voxy? You, don't, you need to give this up. You won't see any change. Focus elsewhere. The fight for digital rights on behalf of my citizens, however hard it continues to be, it's not an easy fight. The fight for digital, digital rights is the fight for all rights. Activists across the world are fighting against draconian laws introduced or enhanced by their governments. 
laws that violate the civil liberties of their citizens in the name of national security. In the name of national security, people have been forced to censor themselves online and offline to avoid arrest and detentions. Internet and press freedom have gotten worse. Travel bans that impact Muslims and demands that Muslim immigrants and visitors surrender social media details and passwords violate their right to privacy. Steps by the US government to increase mass surveillance with weakened oversight mechanism not only threaten freedom to speech and the right to privacy, but give other governments an excuse to ramp up their own expansion of draconian legislations. In the wake of digital terrorists worldwide, in the rush to give broader powers of surveillance and detain, detain, detainments, the need to control avenues of information is a reflexive reaction that we must fight. We are told that greater, greater control of information by the governments could have prevented attacks in Europe, in Northern America, and in Asia. However, we witnessed it was never a right approach. The reality is that we already live in a world where citizens are subject to their personal data being collected, where the websites that they visit and the conversations they have are monitored without their consent or knowledge in an attempt to catch the next potential terrorist. Mass surveillance and invasion of privacy has not discouraged terrorism. Instead, it has put millions of people worldwide under scrutiny from their own governments and has directly or indirectly had a chilling effect on democratic discourse and political actions that are vital to the well-being of a healthy society. Criticism of political actions of the state on internet has termed as anti-state behavior and has been criminalized under different legislation. Security is important, but at what cost? If the right to security overpowers the right to life and liberty, then what is the security in aid of? What are the values that are being defended if the values in question are subject to overly broad scrutiny, intrusion, and lack of respect? Security is important, but it must work in tandem with respect the civil liberties that all citizens of the world have a right to. By working to criminalize forms of expression intentionally or otherwise, we risk losing valuable discourse and pushing people into the welcoming arms of extremists. As we move to defend ourselves from domestic and foreign terrorism, we must ensure that principles of the Universal Declaration be adhered to, that the rights to freedom of expression and movement and the right to privacy, amongst others, are respected. Civil liberties online or online must not be casualties in the, war, in the war on extremism, for democracies cannot truly prosper. Uh, just two lines. I hope, I want to send a message that together we will overcome the injustice, we will overcome the intolerance, and the only th thing that will, that will prevail has to be peace and equal rights for everyone in every corner of the world. I hope that one day we will see the world which all of us want to see, I'm saying this because I'm ridiculously optimistic in these dark times. Here's to offline and online civil liberties, to equality and peace, and here's to humanity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nigat. Um, at this point, I'd like to call on Chagai El Ad from B'Tselem. Yeah, it's working, okay. Um, so I wasn't sure if I'll spend uh, some time of uh, my precious five minutes on explaining the name of the organization, B'Tselem, but Lisa has already done that, so thank you very much. So that's us and that's who we are. And also, uh, before ch changing trajectory into the hopeful comments, I also wanted to um, ex express my uh, deep gratitude to you, President Carter, in answering for me a question that I've been asking myself ever since the results of the elections in November, who speaks for genuine American values? And clearly, you are, so thank you very much for that. Back in uh, 1989, uh, the occupation was already 22 years old. And on that year, the Carter Human Rights Award was given jointly to two NGOs. Uh, one was El Chak, who by that point in time was already, uh, I think, 10 years since its foundation. El Haq, the leading Palestinian human rights organization, uh, and to B'Tselem, who was just established uh, at, that, uh, at that year. It was the very, the very beginning. Now, since then, almost 30 years have passed, and uh, we've won uh, 
uh, I can say this with pride because it's not my work, but the work of my predecessors at, at B'Tselem, uh, not a small number of additional uh, awards over, over the years. Um, and time has passed, and another generation has passed, and now it's uh, 2017, and we're here, and it's barely a month before the occupation is going to be 50, before a complete half century would have passed. We published almost a year ago a document that was titled 17,898 Days of the Occupation. That's 49 years. And since then, another almost entire year has passed. And just the other day, I showed here a during, I think, one of the sessions, a, a short clip produced by Bezalem's video department. It's called Just Another Day. It's just like a 68-second example of some aspects of this, of this ongoing reality. Uh, and I, I must admit that I've seen that clip uh, many a time uh, since, uh, since it was produced. And every time that, that I see it, I, I see it with a deep sense of, uh, of shame uh, and guilt, and often it continues to bring uh, tears to my eyes when I, when I watch it. Because it's not just guilt and shame, but also a deep sense of, of responsibility. People here have spoken uh, a number of times on, on privilege, and I'm a privileged Israeli citizen of the occupying power, and this reality is the responsibility of Israelis, and I'm an Israeli citizen, which means that this reality is also my responsibility and the continuation of this reality for half a century is also my failure uh, in, uh, in changing that. So organizations like to celebrate anniversaries. We are not one of those organizations. We actually would want to get out of business. Uh, and the fact that uh, I can sit here and mention the fact that almost 30 years have passed since you were kind enough uh, and gracious enough to award B'Tselem that, that award is both a sign of the strength of the organization, but also a sign of, of our failure, of our failure to bring an end for the occupation. Now, what about hope? Okay, so I have two thoughts that I wanted to share. Um, and they're both general and also specific to the work of, uh, of B'Tselem. One is a thought about freedom of thought. Uh, not just in the general world, but also our freedom of thought, our freedom of thought to change the way that we do things, to change our ways uh, and to commit to being more, more effective and not to be afraid from the conclusions that that may bring us. And the example that I shared here on behalf of Bezalem was our decision from a year ago to stop filing complaints to a military justice system that has nothing to do with justice in its operations. And our decision to stop doing that for me was not an expression of despair, because despair for me is to continue to do the same thing while knowing that it's not going to be effective. And hope is the commitment to finding effective ways to advance human rights. And that's also the spirit that I've heard here again and again during the four days of this meeting. And the last thing, and with that I want to conclude, is, is courage. Courage, not, not fear. You know, sometimes people ask us, uh, the Israelis working at B'Tselem, how is it that we can continue to face the government incitement and hatred and so on? And I just think of, you know, three Palestinian field researchers, researchers of B'Tselem continue to work during the summer of 2014 in Gaza, when the sense of Palestinians living there was that a bomb can fall on anyone, anywhere, anytime. And if their courage was sufficient to continue working, then of course our, we should be at least uh, as strong to be able to continue to working. And that's exactly the same spirit that I've heard here during these four days. The deep sense of admiration to the challenges, unbearable challenges, painful challenges, that people here have been facing, and the absolute resolute commitment to continue fighting for the values that we believe in. Thank you very much. Oh, oh, now it works. I think it's a plot that mine wasn't working when it rang. Thank you for those remarks. Um, finally, I'd like to call on Rosanna, who's going to share with us another inspirational story of hope. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure and uh, an honor to be sitting uh, with all of you here. 
um, as well as to have um, President Jimmy Carter um, to hear this story as well. My name is Rosanna Issa. I am from Malaysia, from this group called Sisters in Islam. We work uh, to advance the rights of Muslim women um, in Malaysia, but the impact of the work that we do um, has been global, so much so that we have launched a, a global movement for equality and justice in the Muslim family called Musawa in 2009. And since then, uh, the work spearheaded by Musawa on knowledge building, um, capacity building, advocacy uh, has been um, groundbreaking um, in terms of the narratives uh, and discourse um, on how we can advance the rights of Muslim women across the world. <clears throat> Two weeks ago, I was very privileged to have been a part of and to witness um, a gathering in Indonesia of over a thousand women and men from all over Indonesia and some other countries uh, for a very historical event, the first event ever in the world, um, the Congress of Women Ulama uh, of Indonesia. Um, so it was really a very exciting moment. Um, 500 women, over 500 women who have been trained in the tradition of Islam, incorporating gender and women's rights perspective, and who have collectively discussed um, and issued a religious perspective uh, or what the media and the communities uh, have recognized as uh, the fatwa or religious edict on the issues of child marriage, sexual violence um, and environmental protection. And these views are based on the frameworks of human rights, Islamic arguments, progressive Islamic arguments, constitutional guarantees and most importantly, uh, most importantly um, the live realities on the ground. Now, this has been, <clears throat> this was a demonstration um, and evidence um, of a success that focused on movement building that was based on knowledge to address real issues on the ground. Um, nevertheless, it was really very, very inspiring, very hopeful, very invigorating, and what is even more importantly, it's very certain. Um, that certainly, some, that certainty really brings uh, a lot of hope um, for me, as well as my colleagues in SIS and Musawa and um, those who had participated in that Congress. Um, the Indonesians are very modest people, <laughs> um, but I believe that for the Muslim world, the beacon of hope and light on how to forge forward on the engagement with religion and in advancing women's rights, really Indonesia is the country to watch out for. Thank you. She didn't. She doesn't get them back, though. You don't get the numbers back. You did a good job. Um, can you click off your microphone? Thank you. Penda, if you can share with us some of the work that you are doing. The hopeful work. Merci, Hadar. Thank you, Karin Hadar. My name is Penda. I come from Senegal. Allow me first to thank President Carter and Mrs. Carter for your invitation to this very important meeting as defenders of human rights. Mr. President, I would like to say that the people is afraid because it is kept in ignorance. In the present context of the world, the only alternative for the people is to move away from fear and take its own destiny in its hands again. For this to be able to happen, we will need more education for this people with programs that will train responsible citizens conscious of their rights and responsibilities, but also with tools to find a place in the economic and social life of their country. That's the first thing that needs to be done at the base. Without that, the reinforcement of the capacity of the communities. The work we are accomplishing will be more difficult and it will be hard to uh, be successful in this fight for dignity and justice. Uh, the, the education uh, program with the uh, language of Tosan is an example which through a holistic approach 
contributes to the reinforcement of capacity of the communities at the roots for a uh, long uh, development and a uh, transformation positive based on the respect of human rights. It's a program which puts in the uh, front line the communities with its leaders reinforcing their confidence and their trust in uh, protecting themselves with their rights. Since we are those who believe firmly that the solutions to the problems that the world needs to face now will come from the base, from the, uh, from the roots at a community level. Without the involvement and participation of the uh, communities at the roots, our efforts will be uh, useless. Fortunately, Mr. President, the Carter Center understood this very quickly disseminating the good practices with good education via our partnership. We thank you so much. And I would like to make a call through your personality, Mr. President, to the international community to come and uh, support the efforts that are being made to reinforce the capacity of the communities at the root, because this is how we will transform fear into hope and hope for dignity for all of us. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you. We have about 10 minutes left in this session, but hope will remain forever. Um, but we have 10 minutes for conversation. So if you have a, oh, we're going ahead with our list. Although I wasn't sure that those were hopeful comments. Yeah, yeah. All right. If you're going to say something not hopeful, you will now have the opportunity because we have a list. You will have to transfer. If you say something not hopeful, we will cut you off. Just kidding. Um, so Karen is telling me who, who so, we've got on the list already. So, um, I'm going to give um, Amr a chance and uh, Yulia and Zaib. They are next on my list. Um, so, but you've got to have hope. You promise? Promise yeah, there's no. some hope? Yeah. You, will you try? You're from Egypt. We need hope from Egypt. Can you bring it up? Okay. Hello. So my name is Amr Abdul Rahman. I'm from the Egyptian Initiative for Personal Rights. And of course, I'm delighted to be here among this group of inspiring human rights defenders from all over the world. And I'm feeling really inspired by all the stories of the resistance that we have been listening throughout the last, the last few days. Um, just very few remarks about, uh, about some of the lessons that I learned from, uh, from the interventions uh, throughout the last three days and also from our own field work at Egypt and try to link it with some hopeful remarks at the end. First, uh, that the new uh, family of authoritarians that we are facing today is quite different in their relation to the rule of law, and this is something that we have to take into account while strategizing. We are not facing authoritarians who are functioning through the suspension or through the curtailing the law and constitution. We are facing authoritarians who are working from within the same constitution and legal framework utilizing their ambiguities and sometimes actually triggering this ambiguity. And this is something completely new for us. It's no longer the image of the Latin American general authoritarian who is uh, savage enough and vicious enough that we can see in some movies of Oliver Stone. No, I mean, we have people who, are, who may look to some of the Western leaders as sensible, like my president, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, who was actually hailed and praised here in Washington one month ago, met by President Donald Trump, and he got engaged in a very sensible discussion about the war in terror and about the problems of the, of the, of the illegal migrants and many others. And actually, how the authoritarianism works in Egypt, it works through laws, through courts, and basically through collaboration with judges. So now it is the member of the judicial authority that we are facing, not only the members of the police or the members of the army. I mean, for example, criminalizing protest is being done by a law, a law that is pretty similar to some of the laws in the West. Criminalizing the activities of the NGOs are being done by law, very similar to some laws that we can see, for example, in Israel, the only democracy in the region, and also criminalizing other uh, 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 or, or basically curtailing other of the other other defenses or checks on the on the authoritarianism so i mean now we are facing an authoritarianism that is producing its own legality and that is working in an aura of legality and this is something that produce 
not produce additional burden on us in order to engage them. This is one remark. The second remark is that the new authoritarians are popular. I mean, they are enjoying some of the popular support. I mean, uh, be it again Abdel Fattah Sisi in Egypt, being Mr. Putin in Russia, being Trump in, 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 in the United States, or, or those who are ruling now the UK and many others, it is again no longer uh, a dichotomy between authoritarianism and democratically elected presidents. Both now can claim popular support, and both now are talking to popular sensibilities, and both now are talking to people who are suffering from economic crisis, or are suffering from uh, growing social crisis, and uh, 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 a, war, a war in turn. A third remark is that the international scene is much more favorable to dictators and authoritarians more than ever. It is not the time during, like, 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 like how it was during the reign of, 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 of President Carter, or even not the time, I'll try to jump to hope now, <laughs> or even during the time a few years ago with, uh, with, uh, with President Obama, it is actually a, a, a world that is engulfed by fear, not by hope. Hope. I mean, in Egypt, I mean, what happened that, it, that this authoritarian backlash is, 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 is coming against the background of the most hopeful moment, probably, in the history of this region, that's the Arab Spring of 2011. The Arab Spring didn't die, and the spirit there didn't vanish. It's still there, and it's still there in a new generation, especially in the, the educated middle class. This educated middle class who are facing the ghosts and nightmares of unemployment. However, they are still mobilized. I see this in campus since I'm a university professor myself. I see this in campus. And this is something unbelievable and unprecedented how a new generation of the Arab middle class, I'm not talking only about Egyptian middle class, of the Arab middle class that are not any longer fooled by the ideologies of the uh, uh, radical nationalism or the radical Islamism or the ideologies of order and stability that's being propagated by the likes of President al-Sisi, Assad, and many and many others. And those ones who are actually now much more mobilized than we were, and to the extent that we can talk about a parallel or an alternative human rights movement that we have to learn from in the campuses of the Egyptian universities and the Arab universities, and we have basically to readjust our role to be a house of expertise that's basically cater for the new human rights militants who are now in those campuses and who basically deserve to be represented in this kind of forums next year and the years Great. after. And many Thank thanks you, for Amar. that. Thank you, Amr. Thank you. I'd like to call on Zaib. No, 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 Yulia. Yulia, uh, Yulia. Oh, Yulia. 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 But you said to end with, sorry, no. Um, we, we only have five minutes left, so. Okay, so. Sorry. Zaib will come next, but you'll, uh, next session, Yulia is next. Sorry, that I didn't understand. Hi, everyone. Uh, President Carter, it's a great honor for me to be here um, and to be here in this room with all my colleagues. Um, I think I will start with hope and I will end with hope um, on a slightly um, Lighter note, I'm absolutely terrified of public speaking. I've been doing this work for eight years, and every time I have to speak publicly, I feel like I'm going to faint. And yet I'm still doing it anyway, so that's, that's hope. Um, I, <laughs> I, I felt it would be, we would be remiss if we didn't, um, not to mention the um, ongoing war um, in Europe, um, specifically in Ukraine. Uh, it's an armed conflict that is still happening today, um, and it's killed um, over 10,000 people and displaced over 2 million. Um, and it started with um, the revolution in Ukraine, um, uh, after which events uh, unfolded very quickly, where Russia occupied Crimea, so basically um, cut off a chunk of its neighboring territory. Um, in a very sneaky fashion. Um, and then very promptly after that, Russia um, uh, unleashed a war in eastern Ukraine. Um, and I've been to eastern Ukraine many times. Um, and basically parts of Ukraine, parts of eastern Ukraine are controlled by, um, uh, by armed thugs, with, armed with Kalashnikovs, backed by Russia militarily, financially. Um, in, in, in any possible way, um, and they, um, you know, there is no rule of law to speak of. There are enforced disappearances and killings, uh, and that all continues to rise. Um, and you know, Ukraine uh, is struggling. Uh, it's a young democracy that is struggling to to uh, build itself. 
Um, and of course, uh, Putin, as always, and Russia, as always, uh, got everybody exactly where they want them. Uh, they continue to keep this conflict slowly simmering. They're not really going in. They're not really pulling out. Um, and the strategy behind that is, you know, extremely wise for a person like Putin. So on one hand, it helps to keep uh, people mobilized because as we discussed here, nothing mobilizes people better than having an outside enemy or having a country in a state of war. Um, and it also helps to keep Russian people distracted from problems at home, which are many, uh, starting from corruption and ending with a, a huge decline in economy. Um, and to add um, this mutual contract, sort of unspoken agreement between Russian government and Russian people that um, the government will provide us with sort of moderate level of economic prosperity and Russians in response will not take to the streets. Uh, that contract has been happening for, for a number of years now, but the patience is really running thin now and people are actually taken to the streets. Um, very briefly on Crimea, um, it's a territory where, as my colleague mentioned, uh, human rights violations continue to take place uh, with practically complete impunity, uh, especially in relation to Crimean Tatars, which is an ethnic minority that has <laughs> been exiled from Crimea a, a long time ago and just been able to return. Um, so uh, just one line on hope. Um, um, unfortunately, what we're seeing, I said a hope and then I said unfortunately, uh, what we're seeing in Ukraine is that um, sadly Ukrainian government, this domino effect is happening where Ukrainian government is now uh, in a sense, you know, using their position and, you know, using the pretext of uh, Russian aggression to crack down on certain rights at home. We're already seeing that there are restrictions of freedom of speech uh, and it's, it is a democracy that needs support. Um, and there are incredibly wonderful, brave um, lawyers and activists who want to rebuild that country. And they not just need funds, but they need uh, training, they need capacity building and every possible assistance. And Thank hope. You. And hope. And uh, there we go. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you. Can I finish? So these four days have been a respite for all of us, just being together taking a break in this beautiful center and with this beautiful community of strong, caring warriors for hope. So I wanna leave you with this thought. On Sunday, after two intense days of discussion already, we went together to the King Center to honor the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. and to stand in his presence. Outside the museum, many of us saw that there's a rose garden and plaques around the perimeter with poems written by children around the world. This one by Shwaya Gurung in India read, I, I wanna share it with you. It's called Me and You. Alone, I cannot build a bridge, for I may need a helping hand. Alone, I cannot fly. I need wings of your encouragement to soar high. Alone, I cannot embrace all the happiness. I need open arms to share it with. Alone, I cannot spread peace, but together, me and you, we can do it all. So with that thought of hope, we go to a coffee break. <laughs> but before we go to a coffee break, I need an, to, sorry to be, to give such a dull such a announcement. I know, so, I, was, I worked on that. But, I, but it's a very practical matter. You, anyone who needs your reimbursements must do it now. And uh, see Talisha um, and Olivia in the, you only have this break. So please take care of that business. And those who are, have early flights, make sure to have all your things ready to go. You need to load the buses quickly, right at five o'clock, as soon as we break, Run to the shuttle, run. Don't talk, don't walk, run. Now, remember the beauty of that poem and go to break. Me and you. Me and, Me you. and you. Me and you. Me and you. Me and you. Tell them what time to come back. And